This is Raul Lopez, and you're listening to How Do You Say Success in Spanglish? The path to success isn't easy. For minorities and people of color, many attempt this journey with little to no guidance. Join me as I sit down with individuals who share their stories of perseverance so that together we can learn how to say success in Spanglish. What's good, mi gente? It's your boy, Raul. Welcome back. Um, on today's episode, my guest is Kay DeSimone, founder and lead psychotherapist at Pura Vida Wellness Centers. How's it going, Kay? Everything is going great. Fabulous. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially on an early Sunday morning. So uh, really appreciate you coming here and um, hoping, giving us some insight on your life and your journey. So just to introduce you, uh, Katie Simone is a mental health expert that specializes in uh, immigrational trauma and the stressors of high achievers of underrepresented backgrounds. She is a clinical psychotherapist specializing in high achiever stressors, trauma treatment, and personal growth, a licensed clinical social worker in the states of North Carolina, New York, Florida, Connecticut, and and D.C. She earned her master's degrees in social work from Adelphi, Adelphi, Delphi, (laughs) I'm messing it up again, Delphi (laughs) University uh, in New York and was trained at the award-winning Zucker Hillside Hospital, a top behavioral psychiatric hospital in New York. She is a trainer certified in modalities that are gold standard for the treatment of PTSD, trauma, grief, and loss. She is a sought-after paid speaker and trainer on mental health topics related to underrepresented high achievers in high-pressure academic work environments and work environments. Um, when not working, she invests her time in loving her three daughters, getting them credits as, as a doctoral candidate in the University of Alabama. Kay also enjoys pursuing uh, museums and urban fashion stores and is an avid sneaker fan. Kay, thank you so much. Uh, very impressive. It sounds uh, amazing all that you've accomplished. So I guess kind of to start off, um, tell me, uh, who is Kay? Well, Kay is uh, a Dominican-born and American-bred um, citizen. I'm a psychotherapist. I am a mother. I am a doctoral student. Uh, and most importantly, I'm, I'm a community connector. Uh, a lot of the things that I do relate to um, just bringing the information and bringing people resources and connecting people that could collaborate together. I believe that we we are living in a very important historical time where we are able to show up, we're able to show out, and we're able to connect to who we are intrinsically and accepting both of the dualities of, of who we are, not only the country where we came from, in my case, the Dominican Republic, but the, also the country that has received us and where we have grown. Okay, nice. And uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and so your journey to the United States is an interesting one. Um, you know, everybody thinks immigration stories are kind of the same, uh, but yours is a little bit different. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, I think it's very interesting that, that you highlight that because there's also an assumption, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I had one of my little neighbors um, ask me many years ago if he could interview me because they had assigned him like uh, something in social studies where he had to, and I quote, it was several years ago. So forgive the wording. He had to interview an immigrant. So he said, do you mind if I interview you? His mom I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, they created this long list of things. And it was like, tell me, how did you get here? So he was waiting for some juicy story. You know, I had to swim, I had to run, I had to hide. And I was like, I came here on American Airlines flight 588 on seat 4A first stop, (laughs) right? So it was like, oh, I mean, he didn't get no hype at school when he came on my sad story of, I came um, here when I was 24 years old and I was already an adult. I already had my undergraduate degree in business and tourism from the Dominican Republic. But when I came, I had a lot of different advantages and a lot of privileges. I had been part of an organization, international organization, the a leadership group of the YMCA in the Dominican Republic since I was 12 years old. And I had been studying English since I was nine. So by the time that I got here at 24, I already spoke English fluently. I already had uh, my undergraduate degree and I also had a job. So I used to work for American Airlines. That was my job when I was a kid. Uh, and I just transferred. So I came here with a lot of different privileges um, that really helped my transition. But even within that, I, I also had a lot of obstacles, right? I wanted to continue studying. I knew some of the things that I was interested on, but there was nobody to really help me and guide me, which made me lose a lot of years in, in pursuing what was going to end up being um, the passion and the profession that I love. Yeah, I mean, the while well, the immigra- uh, immigration journey for a lot of us varies and goes from different things to the most extreme to the most high, um, 
you know, the sometimes more simplified version of just flying in and, you know, getting your paperwork done done. Um, but even once you've come in, you deal with a variety of different obstacles. So I think one of the things you mentioned, uh, you touch upon is the idea of uh, immigration trauma. Uh, can you explain what that is and um, how that affects you and the rest of us? Absolutely. So that's one of the topics that I am researching um, as my doctoral uh, path. And when it has to do with immigration or trauma, we, we all get here, regardless of what age and what is the composition of our family. And it's a great opportunity. Many of us have been waiting for many years to be able to come and live here. Uh, many of us, when we do that, create, you know, have to manage challenges regarding this great gift but also the great losses. So most of us are here, we're building a life, we're going to school, our parents are working, but three quarters of our families might be in a totally different country, right? Everything that we were has to be re-engineered and it has to be restructured to this society, to this new setup. Many of the people, for example, oh, I could run down the, the street and there was a market and my cousins live close by and then it was, potentially a more expansive community that you had access to. And then when you're brought here, it's like you have this tiny little apartment. Maybe there's a lot of people that live with you. Now you have to learn English. Uh, the children have a very different uh, setup when it has to do with behaviors and, and what is you know polite and what is appropriate. So it's very, very um, shocking when it has to do with other changes in weather. So people, as they get older and they achieve the things that our parents or our families or our sponsors brought us here for, they still have this guilt in the back of their mind. Like I, one of my clients, and it's very interesting, I have a clinical practice where I see individuals one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my full caseload is high achievers of underrepresented backgrounds uh, that have transitioned into the spaces of medicine, law, uh, technology, and finance. So those are the four particular tracks that my clients work on. And it is very hard for you to be, you know, eating and eating your $18 avocado toast with the full knowledge that 70% of your family is living in poverty. It is very hard, even as you grow up and go through all the challenges that, that you guys grow up to know in the back of your mind that your mom is going to hit you up and be like, we need $200 because Uncle Tito fell from the motorcycle drunk again. So we need to pitch in. All this ongoing, it's like almost like all this investment that has been done, a lot of our family is waiting for that return on investment from us. So it's like, oh, when you make it, so then you're going to move back in with us so you can help to pay for the rent. Or you're going to be my co-signer for this loan, or you're going to co-sign this one's you know, student loans. All of those things are very stressful because you're trying to build a life, but also you are centered on the responsibility that you have towards your family in trying to find a balance of what makes sense. Yeah, it's funny the way you mentioned it, where you're like, you feel you su succeeded, you're eating your toast, you're making all this money. And, and I think even like when you're not like that, like you always kind of have that mentality. Like I'm, I was born in Peru and my parents are the one that came here uh, and brought us to this country. Um, so, you know, I, I wasn't sacrificing much. I feel like I just grew up here, but my parents were, you know, but even, mm -hmm. even with that, I've always thought of, my extended family in Peru as my family. And you think about if I won the lottery, well, I'd send money to my grandma and then she could help my uncle in Peru and she can help my other uncles. And, and now your, your millions of dollars are being spread amongst, your, you know, <laughs> a quarter of the population of Peru because you feel like, oh, I still have to figure out how to give back to, you know, everyone mm -hmm. at home. And so it becomes difficult. And yeah. these are things you overcome. And sometimes you're able to overcome and help. Um, you get the help from either people or other resources. What are some, uh, uh, people or resources that has helped you on your immigration journey? So when it has to do with my immigration journey, uh, there are several people because I already what had that background and that framework of the leadership group and volunteering and being part of an international organization um, that was already embedded in me, trying to find mentors, trying to be easy to coach, trying to be easy to help, which is something that I always tell people. You want people to help you, you want people to invest in you, you have to make it easy for them. If the appointment is at 10, you better be there at 9.45. If, if they send you, send me this by Monday, you need to burn the midnight oil, send it by Saturday or Sunday. So I was already prepped 
to do that. So I was able to find people that invested in me and invested not only in me, but eventually invested in the children that I had. Um, I think some of the things that were helpful for me is being very observant. And that is something that I would advise people to, to develop that ability to really invest time and becoming observant. When you're in spaces, what are people doing? What are, where are people going? What, what are people reading, right? I have I have a story that was really good. One, one of the great things I found, um, you know, I have my mother, I have my father, and I I gave them all the props for the person that I am uh, until I was a young adult. But then after that, I had to most definitely give most of the props to, to the other mother that I found, right? One of the things with immigration and trauma, and when you're displaced, in my case, all of my family lives in the Dominican Republic. I'm the only one that came here. Um, so I, I I say a joke, which is not a joke, which is I'm the only orphan Dominican. Everybody has 14 aunts, 13 uncles, you know, there is the tia, the madrina, and I am like the one Dominican. It's like, no, it's just me, it's me, right? So I made a purposeful effort to find really good friends um, and people that I could, uh, you know, have reciprocity with, right? And for example, like I, I, I'm a very big God girl. So I am all about the prayer. I am all about visualization. I'm all about manifesting and just giving back. And it always, you know, just comes back. And I found a, a wonderful lady uh, by happenstance. I always say God sent her to me. I have many verifiable miracles and she is one of those. Um, I worked in a law firm uh, when I became a paralegal after I came here. After many detours, I was able finally uh, able to figure out how to become a paralegal. I attended the City University of New York. I wanted to be a lawyer, but it felt because I had small children, it was like a good next step and it was a professional job. Um, so eventually I ended up after several jobs and you know getting some experience, I ended up in one of the top corporate firms in the world. It's a fabulous job. And it was a, a building with 55 floors attorneys, associates, I mean, the books have been written about this firm. And God sent me to this floor. They sent me to the 38th floor for no reason. I sat next to this lady and, and she's my mother in this country from that day. She has supported me. She has mentored me. She has told me a lot of stuff about education, um, not only for myself, but also for my children, um, resources. Um, so I, I thank her for that. I've also had amazing bosses in the organizations that I have worked in, but it's also because I have walked into the organizations making sure that I become an asset very quickly and that I, by default, receive a special treatment. I am all about a special treatment and accommodations. I say, I already suffer a lot. We all have already suffered a lot from now on. It's only comfort and luxury. And how do we pursue that is by making sure that we are connected, that we are showing up. And in return, my experience has been that the organizations that I've been a part of have matched me exactly where I was yeah. and pushed me forward. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome because lots of times you feel like there's not enough pie for you to eat mm -hmm. and you have to be happy with the scraps that you get. And we don't mm -hmm. advocate for ourselves and we don't push to say, hey, no, I deserve this and I deserve that. And I, you know, so it's mm -hmm. nice to hear that type of style, uh, that type of mentality, um, and the success that it can bring you. And so obviously with part of your journey, you also include the fact that you were in school already, you were in college mm -hmm. when you transitioned. And so for a lot of us, we hear the general story, oh, my uncle was a doctor in Peru, and now he's uh, mopping floors mm -hmm. at a factory or something like that. And so that's not always the case. And some people are able mm -hmm. to maintain and figure out the way. So what were some of the difficulties that you had transitioning to the U.S. as far as your education is concerned? Yeah. So when when I came here, and like I said, there was like just like delay, right? I, I had my degree. I know I wanted to do something else besides the job that I had. And my dream since I was little was to be a therapist. So I am 50 years old. So back in the day, that was not a thing in the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. out of all places. So when I came out with this bright idea that I wanted to be a therapist or I wanted to be a lawyer, you know, my parents had a meeting with my aunts because my aunts, of course, lived with me. So it was like a four parent household, my two parents and my two aunts that were little that they raised me. And the consensus was that if I pursue being a therapist, me a morir del hambre. I was going <laughs> to die of hunger, which is true. <laughs> Because back in 1989, nobody was looking for no therapist in the mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. And in most, most of the parts of the world, it was something that was, you know, very niche for people that had a lot of money and had like 
one percenter problem is not for people that were really going through it like when you live in a developing country my other choice was to be an attorney and that was no bueno either so they were like yeah but if you're not going to go into the government to steal and to do shaky stuff which you cannot do because you're part of our family then you're going to die of hunger too so the two options that i liked and i wanted so then i went into business so when i came here I was like, oh, maybe I could be a therapist. Maybe I could be an attorney. Maybe I can figure it out. So there was no internet. I know the shock in the listeners. Like, oh my God, what? There's no, yes, there was no internet. The internet was literally invented after I was here in the 90s. Uh, so there was no internet. There was no way to Google things. It was not just readily available. And, and one of the things that I, I talk a lot about is like, we have to realize that us in this generation, my generation and yours, we're trying to build lives that have never been built in our bloodline. And when I say that have never been built in our bloodline is lives of plenty, life where you have set income. Oh my God, you have medical insurance that is not the public clinic. You have a good credit score. You, you manage and save to have you know secure housing. We are building lives that have never been built before. And if you add to that, we're also trying to have suitable relationships and happy marriages and date nights and our children with emotional intelligence. So it's like all these things on our shoulders that we have never seen in any generation before ours. The life that I'm trying to build with my, with my children and my partner has never been seen anywhere in my bloodline. So there is that stressor. And then I had no internet. So I was trying to, it took me years to figure out that there was an organization called, called the World Educational Services that takes your degree from your country. If it's a reputable university, that is not like the universities that you just pay and they give you a degree and they have a list of the regular good ones and the other ones that are flaky and you get your stuff certified, which is obviously a headache, go to the R and get a stamp and then the Department of Education and you have to pay some guy in the door, all of that. And then they were able to translate my degree so that I was able to apply for the City University of New York for the paralegal program. And then I was able to, to get the program done. The school did a great job in placing me, uh, you know, and I work through the ranks of, you know, you have a little internship with a little law firm that is literally the guy and some old lady in Astoria. And then eventually um, I transitioned to medical malpractice and personal injury. So I was 1-800 lawyers. So when you call 1-800 lawyers in the early 2000s, that was me. I was like, hi, this is Kay. How can I help you? Uh, eventually I, I transitioned to corporate, which is where the money resided. Uh, and I stayed there um, until eventually I transitioned to finally be able to pursue my dream of becoming a, ther a therapist. While I was in that transition, I was actually studying for the LSAT and applying to law school. And then I was also studying to get into social work school. So I was taking the LSA with Kaplan, they took all my money and I was applying to the schools. And then, but I was actively meeting with mentors. I, there was internet then by then. So I started going to networking stuff. I was very involved in the community life. I, I'm originally, you know, when I came to the States, I, I lived in Jackson Heights, Queens. So repping for the Jackson Heights people. And I was the PTA president in my daughter's schools. I, in many, because of volunteering and being connected is part of, of the way that I was raised. Um, I became, uh, I was part of the board in the precinct, the 115. I was doing all these things and meeting people and these people were connecting me. So I had two different mentors um, that were helping me to look at which was the track to follow. And I pushed on the both tracks until the very end. And I was accepted to law school. And then I was accepted to the social work school. And in talking to praying and talking to my mentors, then I decided that being a therapist was the thing. So I received my offer from the law school and I pursued my social work degree um, in Adelphi University, uh, which in New York is a very, very highly respected university, which in turn allowed me to get placements into internships that were very, very highly coveted, which secure my training, um, clinical training, but also like free trainings as part of the Northwell Health System, which is the biggest employer in New York. So because I was an adult learner, I was very, very deliberate on how I pursue uh, my clinical career. I was very deliberate, um, you know, in the school about my classes. Uh, I was also very deliberate on my internship. My school has a policy. Oh, they're going to hear it. They have a policy that does not permit you to find your own internships. So you have to wait for them to assign you. Well, I have a saying in the back of my mind, rules do not apply to me. 
So I always try to find what is the most efficient way. I always try to find the loophole. And I got my two internships myself. And then I finagled away with the ladies, the secretaries, just my friend. I always have chocolate. I always carry candy. I always, you know, little gifts, little dulce de leche, little jokes. And I got my own internships and the school assignment to those. And those were the two things that supported me into fast track in my career. Uh, when you're in school as a social worker, they could send you anywhere. They could be like, oh, go to the YMCA and you're going to be filling out section A vouchers or you're going to be doing this. I knew I wanted to do clinical. So I was not in interested in institutional work. I knew that my work and my passion and my calling was to help people heal and be their companion uh, in their healing mental journey. Um, so I did that. So after I did that, after I was in Adelphi, it was very challenging financially because for a master's level, they don't give you financial aid uh, and money was super tight. I had to take all kinds of loans and, and do all of the things, uh, but I did really well in school. Uh, and the reason that I did really well in school, which I speak, is not a secret, I speak very openly about it when I do presentations. Um, I have a very high genetic psychiatric load on the right side of my family. So on, the, on the, my mother's side of the family, we have chronic mental illness. So I have, you know, uncles and aunts, and I've had grandparents with everything from bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, neurological disorders like Parkinson's, all of the things. So I grew up, and that's why I wanted to be a therapist since I was little, because I would be four years old, and I'll I be like, why can't my favorite aunt get better? And it was because of lack of appropriate treatment and for the fact that we were poor. Right, so we didn't have the medication, we didn't have appropriate care, and it was the Dominican Republic in the olden days. Um, so school for me, when it has to do with therapy, when it has to do with trauma, when it has to do with grief, when it has to do with loss, school is very easy for me because I'm not learning it from the book. So when I had to be like, oh, bipolar disorder, I'd be like, mm, my uncle, this one, da, 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 and I knew the presentation, and I knew the symptoms, and I knew the dysregulation, how it looked like, the changes of energy. Other people had to like read it and learn it. I'll just be like, oh, what? Schizophrenic, okay, so I had that aunt and that uncle, and he did this. So it was very easy and it was very natural for me. Um, and also created the sense of urgency that I work with. So I work, I, I worked very hard and I'm, as you said before, certified in all the modalities to treat the highest level of dysregulation. So I went to Zucker and Zucker is one of the top psychiatric hospitals in the country in one of the top in New York. And I was in, I was on like Donkey Kong. I was in every track. I was like, I was going in when I was off. I, if there was a training that was free because, I mean, they cost a lot of money, but if you're an intern or work there, they give it to you for free because of the union. I would be going on my days off. I, I have too many certifications. I have too many trainings because I wanted to be training the highest level of dysregulation so that I could bring that level of expertise down to the people down here on the fringes, right? Because I know because of my personal experience and of my family, that one hour, one day, one week, one month suffering is one to many because within that small window is where the horror happens, right? That's when you make that bad decision. That's when you take that horrible reaction. That's when you make that decision that you have to live with for the rest of your life. But more, more I, I also took a different take where I say, you know, like, I was, I, I was a, I'm a financial aid kid, a proud financial aid kid. Um, so I went to scholarships uh, since I was in pre-K until eighth grade in a Catholic school. And, you know, of course I was a Catholic school girl and the Bible study and all that. And they would say, oh, when somebody does a sin loosely, I'm here sharing this. I don't remember like the versicle or anything. Like when somebody does something, it goes down to seven generations. Like almost like a curse. Like, oh, you, you be doing something against God. And it's like, you curse for seven generations. And then as I started doing this work in the psychotherapy world, I was like, oh my God, it's not that God is cursing you. It's that this decision that you make reverberates for seven generations down the line of the pain, of the hurt, of the lack of resources, of the lack of support for all of the people that come after. So for me, getting better and doing better, getting resource, getting support, for me, it's like handling on the list an emergency. Because of that, also, I train on the modalities that are evidence-based. Like a lot of people say, I'm going to go to a therapist. It's like, it has to be evidence-based. Talk therapy is delightful and it helps a lot of people. But if you have challenges that are embedded in your physical body, in your biological body, if you're getting those headaches, if when something sounds, you react, all of those things have to be processed with other modalities that are somatic modalities, because it's not only 
your memory. Intellectually, you know that's not happening. That was before. But your body and your brain do not know that. Hence, you have all the hyperactivity. So when I went into the therapy world, I was like 10 toes down and I was on it. I was getting mentored by the top doctors. I was making myself available. I was working many more hours than I had to. I just love it and I love it every day. So that allowed me to not only pursue my career very diligently, um, but also to be able to advocate, but more importantly, position myself for others to do for me. So um, through all of that, and you've become a psychotherapist and a mental health engineer, can you kind of explain exactly what a psychotherapist and mental health engineer is? Right. So a mental health engineer is a term that I came up with uh, with my partner because I am from a family of engineers. So everybody's an engineer, my brother, my dad. So I'm the one that doesn't have the engineering degree. And when I was looking at the description of what an engineer does, it's like, oh, addresses problems and creates a workflow to solve them. And I was like, oh, so that's what I do. And it sounds so much cooler. Um, so when it has to do with, with psychotherapy, so a psychotherapist, depending on the modality and the credentials, it's very much a person that's going to be with you in your journey of becoming aware, of reframing some of your past story and creating um, a structure so that you can continue forward based on your values, on your goals and who you want to be today right so there is a lot of people that you know like the work that I do I, I deal a lot with PTSD and higher levels of uh, symptoms that were rooted let's say on, on poverty racism and neglect actual physical or, or sexual abuse um, in order to release that from your body and for you to have a better awareness that that was then and this is now and now you have other options um when it has to do with, with being a psychotherapist based on the modality and what this the specialty is everything should be um you know client center so i practice from a decolonizing perspective which means my client remains the expert right? and i am simply i am not main character right i am simply a companion on their journey when it has to do with us with pursuing services or offering services um, it is important to remember that in finding the right fit not only for the client to find the right provider but also for providers should be working with the right fit of clients for them when you're working with your ideal client is that there's an understanding as you're getting your degree and your credits and your hours of supervision you're going to do the job that you're going to do and you're going to treat whoever um, the setting treats, but then there should be a transition uh, after you have your licenses and stuff so that you can be treating the people that you're better fit to treat. In my case, um, the perfect fit for me is exactly the high achievers of underrepresented backgrounds in high pressure environments um, because we have very specific and very unique needs, right? We have to balance so much when it has to do with our aspirations, which many times the rest of our family do not understand. Why do you want so much? You have your job, you have your wife, you have your little house, you're fine. Like, why are you trying? We have a drive that is different. We have um, thoughts in our mind of pursuing things that make no sense to anybody else. So we can do the work to come to terms of what is our calling? Like, what was whispered in our ear was only whispered to us. There is also, you know, putting into perspective, especially when you're a high achiever, sometimes somebody will have, a mother will have three, four kids, and maybe you're the one that hit it big, big, whatever big it is. You have a job, you work for finance, you, you know, you have your six figures going on, and then nobody speaks about it. It's one of the things that I'm pursuing going forward. So when it has to do with my research that I'm doing on immigration or trauma, I'm going to be publishing on that because it's a, it's a topic that is not very well explored. It is explored from the place of PTSD, horrible things happen on your way here, who has seen laws. But there are two other parts that are not being covered currently in academia and in research. And research is what informs policy. So that is the importance of doing research is to get that data so that you can be, you know, the politicians, the decision makers, etc. It's like, look, this is a thing, right? So if you take it from the place, um, I was very fortunate. Um, last summer, I was able to participate with my university. I became the first uh, study abroad doctoral student that University of Alabama have ever had. They had ever done it. They didn't know how to do it. And I was like, well, I guess that's your job and you're going to have to figure it out because as we both know, rules do not apply to me, right? But with ease and fun and, and you know, and all of that, but I got it done, which was surprising. So I went to Guatemala and I was there doing research for four weeks. 
um, under the, the support of the megastar, Dr. Chris Hale, which is an expert on Latin American studies. And the things that I learned, I am so grateful. Of course, I got my six credits so that I can graduate faster because ain't nobody got time for that. But most importantly, even as, as an expert in trauma and a, a researcher in immigration and trauma, being there and seeing it with my own eyes and having to study, I had to do research and write papers for six months before I even got there. Now I have a so much better understanding. So if we think about, and I'm gonna use Guatemala, I'm gonna use the Dominican Republic too. So when you look at Guatemala, right? In the Dominican Republic and Peru, our countries have been ravaged by first the colonization, right? So the poverty that was induced by the colonization, the racism that was embedded by the colonization against the native people and the mulatto people and the Latinos. Then we will go on into if that was not enough, how it was debased and many native, uh, we have no Tainos. We, Tainos passed away in the Dominican Republic. They were decimated within five years. Um, but even if you take that right, is the fact that we have been ravaged by earthquakes, hurricanes, political unrest, dictatorship, lack of education. So our parents, this is where our parents are coming from. So when you're like, oh, they bullied me in school, they were like, did they disappear, your father, never to be seen? They, they don't have the bandwidth to understand our predicaments, right? Put your head down and don't look up. Where did they learn that? Colonization. They learned that into our multiple dictatorships. And they learned that by the forces of the United States, disparaging everything that we built century after century, right? I mean, when you think about Guatemala, had the longest civil war in all of Latin America that lasted. 30 plus years, right? When you think about the fact we had a dictator, uh, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, that not only ruled us with an iron fist for 30 plus years, but he was replaced by his, by his boy, which ruled the country in a democratic government for 12 years and decimated the intellectual fabric of the Dominican Republic. He decimated and killed all scholars. You were dead, you were a scholar, you were a revolutionary. He killed the educational and scholar base of the Dominican Republic in the 70s. What does that do to the Dominican Republic today, right? And how does that explain, let's say how certain countries, in the Dominican Republic, everybody has one, two, three degrees. Everybody's trying to go to college and they're all different bases of colleges and you know how much they cost and what they do. But the guy that's driving you in the carro publico, in the, you know, in the gypsy cab, he's like, oh, I'm an attorney. And you're like, for real? is that pursuit of education is so, so important because in the 70s, they literally took every scholar from us and then eventually we're able to study again. So when we're looking at that, so nobody's covering the fact that this is where we're coming from. This is our parents are bringing our grandparents, right? So then they drop us here, boop, but nobody's, and then they're like, oh, yeah, you and you, you were affected because you were coming and you saw this and you saw that. But nobody's also covering the fact of how hard it is when you go to a family get together and a bunch of your cousins are, you know, upset. Oh, she should be talking white. She has a little apartment in the city or she moved to New Jersey. She thinks she's better than everybody else now. How our parents, when they pursue education for us and, and support us in the ways that they could, how a lot of their family members did they understand? It's like, no, why are you gonna leave him here doing the, let's say, prep for prep program in the summer? Send him to the yard with the abuelo so that you can descansar, so you can rest. And the pressure that our parents also felt, the fact that they're like, oh, you have to study, you have to go to school. Mom, what does that look like? Who's going to fill up my FAFSA, right? The fact that some of us are DACA, and, and I mean, just a week ago, they came up with that nonsense, right? So it's this ongoing chronic trauma and this ongoing stressor that has to be covered so that we know how to normalize it, how to address it, and how to find community within, within our circles um, to move forward. So when it has to do with immigration or trauma, those are some of the things that happen that are not fully covered. When it has to do with identity-based trauma, which is based on the work of uh, Dr. Desiree Dixon, one of my colleagues and mentors, you have an imposter syndrome, right? So listen, you have stickers, you have a shirt, there's always a webinar, imposter syndrome. And until I found her, I had a really big problem with presenting and dealing with it because I see it in the field. I see it in my patients. I see it in my in my presentations. I, I work for opportunity programs and heal programs, let's say New York University, State University of New York, Villanova University. I see it. They, these kids don't think they're less. They, it's not, I, I, 
I didn't create this for myself. I'm not an imposter because I think I'm not worthy. And then when Dr. Dixon came out and I found her, it made my life better because she created a different, a different, a different way to explain it. She doesn't go imposter syndrome. Doesn't exist. It's mislabeled. What exists is identity-based trauma. So imposter syndrome is like, oh my God, I believe I'm not worth it, blah, blah, blah. Opposed to what reality is, identity-based trauma, which is our community, our society, our media, is telling us every day, in every step, every time you walk into a store, every time you board a plane, every time you pass into TSA, they are challenging our work. Every time you go into a big tech company and you're the only brown person in the vertical, the message is being given to you. You're not making this up. You don't feel like an imposter. The system thrives on making us feel that we don't belong, right? And I always tell, I have clients and my clients work for all the top companies, right? And this is the thing that they're working on. Their life is on point, their job is on point, they have their education, they're all they're in school, they're doing well in school. But it's this nagging feeling of, I don't belong. But is it because I don't believe I'm worth it? They believe they're worth it. So this gives us a different explanation and a different process to be able to manage it, treat it, and release it. All the work that we have to do is not like, oh, I'm going to go to therapy so I can talk about it. That's cute. And that helps a little bit. But what needs to happen is that you have a culturally competent provider that is certified and trained on the modalities to treat what the situation is. Talking about it and journaling about it, those are first aid kind of stuff. Love it. I use it in my own practice. But there are different levels of treatment that allow you to actually release it, that allow you to create a structure. And then you decide, what does K do? We always go through this anxiety. If they offer me this, if they ask me for that, if they give me something that's not part of my job, what do I do? Because we don't have a center. When you do the work and you strengthen yourself, and you say, this is what K does. And I have a script. Thank you so much for thinking of me for that DEI meeting, which of course, all the brand people, they want to have us do DEI and, and affinity groups when there are people that's actually their job outside consultants. But you know, they put, thank you so much for thinking of me to be in that panel. I really appreciate it. But unfortunately, I'm now concentrating on my deliverables because review time is coming. But keep me in mind, well, I'll get back to you on that. So many people are put into these boxes that have nothing to do with the job that you're getting paid to do. So when promotion time comes, when the label, layoffs be coming, you were outside doing the workshop and doing the panel and traveling for this and being the picture of diversity on the website, but you have not concentrated enough on the meaty stuff that is the reason why they hire you. You want to be a team player. Let's work hard. No, no, no. I am all about let's work smart. Let's strategize. Let's be observant. Let's follow the money. What are the people that have the money and the access doing? What conferences are they going to? Can I help? Can I have my company pay for this? And if not, let me tell you, I'm gonna apply for that scholarship on the website. Or I'm gonna Klarna this. We be Klarna in all the stuff. We do Klarna for Shein, we do Klarna for, no, no, let's do Klarna for a conference, right? When people say, what do you want for Christmas? I want money because I wanna go to Afrotech. So let's put it in this little Afrotech account. That's what I want, right? So looking at it from that perspective, I think advocating is great, but I think developing the skills so that you go in, so that people from the get understand you're not the one, but you're also not the two, right? And that's something that you can create. And, and when we look at the ways that we behave of the things that we're missing, I, I like the title mental health engineer because I look at it just like it's an obstacle, it's a problem, it's a situation. How do we break it down? I don't, we do the work in, in therapy and when I do presentations so that we stop internalizing the things that have happened to us, the messages that the society has given us, so that we can look at it from a clinical, practical, logical perspective and say, I get very nervous when I speak in public. You internalize that. Oh, I'm so weak. I'm so lame. What I have to say is not important. This is what we think, right? So our internal talk, our negative talk is to what I'm saying. Opposed to when we step back and say, I have a very hard time speaking in public. And what can I do about it? And you literally come up with little tasks. It could be 
that you start listening to a podcast that has to do with speaking, that you get one book from the library, that you Google a couple of people that are giving tips on, on speaking so that your algorithm in the TikTok and the Facebook and in the Instagram changes to start giving you material that has to do with that. I get very anxious and scared. I'm so anxious. We internalize that as this bad, horrible thing. I'm permanently damaged. I'm never going to get better. But when we do the work to be able to step back and say, I am very anxious and I am very hypervigilant, right? On my sex at all times, because horrible things have happened to me or to people around me. You're not crazy. You're not coming up with this. Hey, let me be anxious because I have nothing else to do. You have seen horror and challenges and you have seen this other shoe drop so many times that you could have a whole shoe store. But we can say, I am very anxious and hypervigilant because of the things I have seen and I have experienced. And I'm going to download the Calm app and I'm going to do some breathing exercises and I'm going to... If we are able to see the thing and understand that we don't have to go from zero to 100, we can do small steps. I have a lot of issues with friendships and, and people always take me for granted. Not for everything. I have a lot of issues with friendships and people always take me for granted. And I'm going to start looking for stuff that has to do with assertive communication. My girl, Nidra Tawab, she is my boo. I think she's my friend, my mom. I don't know her. The, the super therapist that wrote the book, Boundaries. She has a whole book, 1999. Download it, get the workbook. Let's go, right? It's not permanently yours, right? Our parents did the best that they could. And most of the times for us, that was not enough. Not to survive in this country and not to pursue the life that we want. So we can say, my parents did the best that they could, and that was not enough. And I still, if you have a relationship with them, I still love them and respect them and support them. And I'm going to outsource myself another mom or another dad or a group of mentors, or I'm going to listen to a podcast about the mother wound if you have a challenging relationship that's been neglectful and, and hurtful with your mother. If, if there were issues with your father, I'm going to buy a workbook, right? These things can be true, and this is what I'm going to do little by little, right? Maybe it is we meet people where they are, and one of the reasons, so my next steps in my career, because I do not have space on my caseload, so no nobody be DMing me trying to get on my caseload. I do not have space in my caseload. <laughs> um, in the next steps of my career, that's why I have it started with the speaking and the paid speaking in order to bring the message, because I understand not nobody's going to be able to work with me, but I have the source and I have the message and, and the information so that when they go to pursue a provider, they are a knowledgeable consumer, right? So when they go and have those conversations, they understand, oh, I don't have insurance right now. That's okay, but we have the Loveland Foundation. Rachel Cargo will be giving vouchers to the people. Taraji Jensen did a whole foundation to honor her dad that had, you know, also mental health issues, they have vouchers for people too. There's a National Association of Mental Illness. They have workshops, they have peer groups, they have materials, they have worksheets. You can. There are things that we can do if you are in a school. We're gonna give ourselves the permission to go to the counseling center. There are the fancy schools have life coaches. Did you know that? Like the fancy schools, they have life coaches. They text you, I have a, a life coach that texts me. Hi, hey, I hope you start the semester strong. I say, thank you, boo, right? We're going to use that. We're going to change our mentality from those things are for somebody else, right? It applies with the tutoring. When I work with the OP, the opportunity programs, and a lot of our children have attended very challenging and toxic public schools and Catholic schools where teachers don't want to help you, where if you raise your hand, you're dumb, where if you go to tutoring, you're labeled as dumb too. And then they transition to colleges that have all this support and they never use them. And then I have the conversations and we do the work so that they understand that there are other races and other backgrounds that they are at the top of the class. And as soon as they get there, they get the next 12 tutoring all the way until the end of the semester. Not because they're trying to catch up, because they're trying to stay ahead of you. So by the time that me and you, regular schmoes, be trying to get <clears throat> a tutoring session, guess what? They're all gone. Right? So we have to stay prepared so that we don't have to get prepared. Right? When these offers are, are given, we take them. 
it's like I said, so you got to do your job. We need to figure out how I'm going to stay in the school, where this money is going to come from. Who else can I talk to? To, to, the, to the people that have gotten to this place of they are already successful. What comes next, right? So I'm also very involved in um, independent schools. So independent schools are schools, uh, elementary to high school, that are not funded by the state and they're not funded by the Catholic or any religious church. So independent schools have been around since the 1700s. These are the schools for 1%. Other children have been there for legacy and legacy. There is a very big movement to transition into the schools. I have done the work and have done the fight and the driving up and down all the Northeast. So my three daughters have been uh, blessed with being part of the independent school uh, organizations. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. It has been the best, the hardest thing that we have ever done, but it has been the best thing we have ever done because being part of independent schools has created for them and for me a network and a support system that is um, parallel with anything else that I have, right? Many of us are going to be like, oh, I'm going to leave my kids all these millions and these 10 buildings. But when you have your child in yourself as part of an independent school, and we'll put the link under so if anybody's interested in looking at it, your life changes because your children, my daughter is not Isabella, the daughter of Kay, right? Isabella is Isabella from Friends Academy, Sophie Academy, Loomis, Taft, Andover, the Duke Lead Program, the Babson Pre-College Program, the NYU Pre-College School of Engineering, NYU University. There is a center of people that will be vouching, fighting, and investing on your kid and the kids that come through them long after you have been gone. So when it has to do with success, how do we maintain it? What is the thing we can give our kids? Um, for the people of, of Hispanic uh, backgrounds, the National Hispanic Institute, I mean, don't sleep on that. The National Hispanic Institute, they meet every year in the summer. They have different institutes in five, six different cities. There's one in the Northeast. And high achieving Hispanic children from all over the United States and international countries come and learn how to debate, how to advocate, how the government works. They have the college um, access, access symposium when they're in 11th, 12th grade. They already have colleges that are working with them, right? So they're waiting for your kids. So it's not only showing up for ourselves, you know, advocating, but it's like we need to concentrate on positioning. We need to concentrate on using the resources that are already available to us because we already did the most dangerous thing anybody could have ever done. I always say at the beginning of my life, I did the, tr the three more reckless things I could have ever done. I was born brown, poor, and female, right? So we did all of that. We transitioned. We've been going through, through the grinder for things, but we're in this space and it's like we started from the bottom. Now we're here. And we want to make here even better because we are deserving, because our voices are important, because we bring life experiences and we bring this as song, right? This, this school, this organization, they're looking for you. They're looking for your kids. They embrace you, right? So we don't tell ourselves no, but what we do is we resource ourselves and find who's the person that knows, who's the connect. I tell, I tell my clients, I tell my kids, I, this, I tell myself every day, go into LinkedIn, find two people every week. I do it every day. But if you don't have a press for time, every week, find at least two people that when you see them in their bio, in their post, you say, I want that life. Not that I want that life and I'm going to take it from dude, but I want that life. And then all you have to do is go on their bio and reverse engineer what they did. When I go to open houses, listen, I go to open houses. Well, my kids already accepted to those schools. I go to the other schools to see what they got. And I sit there and talk to them. Be like, oh, so what's little Johnny doing this summer? That's how I find the school. I have nobody to tell me where to go, what to do. But if you tell me he's going to this program, you know, I'm with my paper here, writing this down. And I have it in my little folder, right? Who knows what you need, right? I read this really good book. Um, it's called Who, Not How. Right? And it's changing our mentality. Who within our network can facilitate? What, what advantage can we bring to them? I always start not by asking any of you from anybody. I always connect with, how can, this is who I am. How can I help? What do you need? 
what kind of a life are you trying to build? And then from my network, I pull and say, oh, I can give you this. I'm not even asking you for nothing. But the universe returns for you things tenfold. And that has been my experience, right? Of us showing up, owning our story. There's a lot of, 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 of messages about, you know, being ashamed. I'm a financial aid kid. Listen, I'm a financial aid kid. I'm a financial aid mom. How do you like me now? And I walk into, this orga into these organizations with pride, right? Because they're giving me this money, whether it's for myself or for my kids, but I'm giving them myself. I'm giving them my kid. They're winning. They still owe me. Even after giving me this big scholarship, my kids have received $2.5 million of scholarships. And we have earned every single one of those dollars. We have also paid out of our mouth money that we didn't have, okay, throughout many times. Because even though they give you very generous financial aid packages, there's still a gap that you have to cover, right? But we have earned that. And I have, listen, me and my kids were internationally known in the microphone all over the Northeast. All the DC Mom girls, schools will always make a space for us. They'll make the spot, they give us the money because they know, and I write in my letters, right? Because they, this is the whole thing. They interview the kid, they interview you. You have to write like 14 essays and all kinds of paperwork. And I have the, 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 the goal and the certain feeling in my heart that I write on my essays. I know my daughters are going to be successful whether you accept them into the school or not. If you want to be part of their story, because there will be children to be claimed in the newspapers. And these are the children that I'm raising. If you want to be part of the story, get on. But they will be successful whether they're accepted to the school or not. I am also the, the financial aid mom that looks at the director of admissions on her eyes or his eyes and said out of my mouth, and I say out loud to the universe, I, want, I am on financial aid today. I want buildings with my name on it. And I see that like I have seen everything else that has come to pass, right? That's the certainty of the work that I'm doing and the work that I'm doing with myself and for my kids, right? We show up and we earn our spot every day. This is one of the lines of my essay. We will get accepted and we will work every single day to re-earn the spot and the investment that you're making. That's a gangster move that has been proven over and over again. Many people, oh, I got into the school. I got into BU. I got into the whatever, the, the TAF, this and that. And then that really hype when they get the letter, but then they start uh, 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 slacking. Mm -mm, not us. We were in our spot every day. That's part of our brand. And we have delivered. And it might be that you're like, I'll be like, they don't have the highest SAT because they don't. Because, oh my God, your kids went to the great school. They might be so gifted. They're not gifted. We're hardworking, right? We're hustlers. Gifted, that it comes easy, that's not a thing. Not for my kids. Some people do have that blessing. I've seen it myself. They don't have the higher SAT, but I can promise you here that they will graduate and they will finish. Because if I have to throw them by their teeth over the fence, that's what we're going to do, right? And it has come to pass. So it's just showing up for ourselves and not being ashamed of our story. I drive a Honda Civic. You have your Master RV. Like, listen, it's all good. You know, we don't have we don't have to share our story with everybody either, right? Nobody's entitled to our story either. We have to have scripts for that too. How we navigate the world, how we interact with others. Oh, you going? You all going to Myrtle Beach in the break? Yeah. I'm going to go check on my grandma to see what's up. Without internalizing, that makes you less. Oh, they, you know, they're going to think about me. No, it just this is a delivery, right? So you can create all those structures for yourself. So life just feels easier, right? When people like us are looking for education, high income, uh, and, you know, the white picket fence, we're not looking because we're trying to bling bling, right? Because those things give us what? They give us safety. They give us protection, right? They Living in a better neighborhood gives you a better chance at having a good school system, at having less issues with violence, right? Having a good job 
gives you more of an ability to have all your benefits, medical, 401k, all this stuff, and having a steady income. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for this, this moment like this. That is all we're pursuing with everything that we do, right? And it's, it's just creating mantras for yourself. I say to myself, I deserve the world and everything in it. I say to myself, I'm not the one and I'm not, and definitely not the two. I say to myself, rules don't apply to me. But I also say to myself, nobody's going to go harder and smarter. Harder by itself is not enough. But harder and smarter, very few can do it, right? Yep. So it's a, uh, it's a lot to uh, unpack on that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it reminds me of a lot of things because a lot of points, a lot of things you point out are very true. You know, and then there is this, you know, just kind of a little, go a little bit back on what you were saying, but there was this part of this, I guess, kind of like generational trauma that you deal with your parents mm-hmm. and moving forward. And I think at this generation of our generation, we're kind of a little more read up and more open to changing who we are to improve ourselves as opposed to sticking to what mm-hmm. we've been dealt mm-hmm. with our whole life. And so I have a daughter now, she's 10, and I'm raising her completely different than when I was raised. You know, I don't mm-hmm. hit her. Um, I talk to her. Um, I try she to gets, She gets to talk back. Yeah. Uh, well, she converses with she, you. <laughs> we, 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 talk, we try to talk as adults. You know what I mean? That's and I try to keep it where it's like, if she has an issue and she gives me attitude, it's like, I don't talk to you that way. You don't talk to me that way. Mm, you know, but also I work on building um, skill sets that I never had. Confidence. Mm-hmm. Confidence in mm-hmm. yourself. Not... Mm-hmm. You know, she'll tell me I can't do something. And I say, no, it's not that you can't do nothing. It's that you don't have enough experience that it's easy for you. And you have Mm -hmm. to work a little harder and practice more to get that skill set that you want to get. You know, and I try to build build risk taking, you know, teach Mm -hmm. her that, hey, it's okay to try Mm -hmm. something that you're afraid of. And hopefully it'll help you get where you want, you know, but the stuff that I do and it's, you know, even my dad's journey from mm-hmm. being Peruvian raised by a, 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 a you know he, he never knew his dad and so mm-hmm. he came to this country he sacrificed everything worked hard blue collar mm-hmm. old school Peruvian I used to get beat all the time you know what I mean like it was very you know mm-hmm. hard whatever and now he's you know in his 60s and retired and we sit down and talk and he me and him talk all the time now you know compared to like when I was little and he will even come to me and says I love the way you're raising your daughter. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I grew up, I didn't know how to raise, I wasn't, I was, I didn't know how to raise kids. I was doing mm-hmm. it myself and you're doing stuff that I wish I would have done with you guys. You know, and I was mm-hmm. like, and I told them like, you know, it's a journey for all of us and you did the best you could and you should be proud of where I'm at and be proud of the fact that I'm able to take what you did and try to improve on it. You know what I mean? And for a lot of us, I think, we, you know, we talk about generational wealth, generational stuff, but mm-hmm. it's very important the way you put it out, where it's like, not mm-hmm. just generational wealth, but let's improve our generational trauma so that we can become mm-hmm. more successful and get over it. So I think that's very beautiful. And I think it's a, a wonderful thing. And I love the advocating for yourself, which is another thing we all mm-hmm. don't do very well, because we do, all of us have always been in a situation where we know that one asshole who works half mm-hmm. as hard, mm-hmm. gets twice mm-hmm. the promotions and does makes more money lives a better life than you ever did yeah, why because he knows his shit don't stink well he thinks his shit don't stink and he's always mm-hmm. willing to push himself in that situation to put it so like i said um but I'll, but it is also the fact that that guy has a network that has a network and also it, and it could be the smaller and the bigger things like like we don't know like we get this job we're tired like we're like oh i'm not going to that uh happy hour that's stupid oh no you bet you better go to the happy hour because if you don't go to the happy hour nobody's going to put you in their project they don't know who you are people want to work with people that they like even if they're incompetent so those are the differences for us it's like the the best has to win and the victor will be you know the person that deserves it the more but that's not the reality that's not how the world works but we can use that to our favor also right by staying observing by strategizing by connecting ourselves with something that's bigger than us all of the organizations the fraternities the professional organizations if you are in your, if you have children being involved with a pta having the teachers know who they are and who you are so when the favor or the accommodation is needed it's already within the level of reciprocity that they will have towards you yeah right? and, and it's not to say that like I never, I don't believe the idea that there are no obstacles that we ever have to overcome that are placed mm-hmm. in those spaces of our race or where we're from and stuff like that. <clears throat> there is, there is, there's always something societal that we overcome, but the opportunities are there 
And a lot mm-hmm. of times we don't know mm-hmm. which opportunities are there for us to take or that they're even worth taking for us. You know, that's kind of one of the mm-hmm. reasons I want to do yeah, the yeah, podcast. Yeah, like this absolutely. is like, <clears throat> they're there. Those happy hours aren't just for people to go get a beer and free food. Mm-hmm. Go and meet your coworkers because at some point mm-hmm. you might need to reach out to them because they left your job. And they might need something or a hundred percent or when they have in, in a lot of these top companies in finance and tech, their evaluation is horizontal, but it's also vertical. So the, even the people that are under you are reviewing you and the people on top of you and the people on your side. So it's like this very macro evaluation. What is the perception of you in those spaces? And by doing your own healing, by reframing your narrative of who you are, by accepting that the things that you want are for you to want. It's not for your mom and your cousin and your neighbor. It's for you to want, right? And that you are so deserving. And that whatever skills you're missing, we simply patch it up. I say, for example, that the iPhone is one of the greatest pieces of technology ever invented. And the iPhone in all its greatness, every month be like, I'm going to update myself, whether you want it or not, 12 o'clock, I'm upgrading my system. We can look at it from that perspective too, where these are simple skills that we have to upgrade. These are different instances that we have to release. And there is a way, there's evidence-based ways that work. Nobody has to be in therapy for five years and 10 years. Oh my God, if I start therapy, I'm going to be there forever. No, if you if you're going working with an efficient therapist that's properly trained, certified, and has cultural competence, most people don't have to go to therapy forever. They can go for a few months, they go for a year, and then after that, they're fine. If you have a chronic condition that you need ongoing support, that's a different story. But the big part of the population is a tune-up. And a therapist is really an adult that's going to talk to you about whatever you want for an hour, and your insurance is going to cover it. Yep. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I have a therapist mm-hmm. and that way I, I talk and I complain and she's neutral and she calls me on my bluff and she redirects me. Therapies have therapists and so much so that therapy is tax deductible for therapists. How you mm-hmm. like me now? Yeah. And I, I told you at the beginning before we, we started recording that it's it's a journey that we keep, keep popping up. Um, it's a part of people's journey that keeps popping up is improving their mental health and seeing therapists um, in all, almost all my interviews. And it was something that while I always recommended, I never felt the need to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm-hmm. like, now I'm taking that steps to be like, you know, I'm going to go see a therapist. Absolutely. Uh, and and even ask me, like, well, do you have any issues? Like, I don't have any issues, but I figure mm-hmm. it's not going to hurt me if I try it. No, and it's been absolutely. wasted on my insurance for the past 15, 20 years. Let's let, go. Let when I'm take about to cash those vouchers yeah. in, absolutely. What's well, the worst right. that's going to happen? I get better at being who I am. You know, like, right. You and, know. and also the other thing that I want to add as you're saying that, when people are looking, you know, there are certain resources that we can post to help them and stuff. Yeah. But it's just like doing your nails or getting a haircut. If you go to a barber and he messes up your hair, what do you do? I'm never going to the barber again. Yeah. <laughs> Screw my nails. I look like a monster forever. No, you're like, oh, I'm never going back to that salon, but maybe I'll try somewhere else. Yeah. And it's the same thing. There's There are skills and resources that we can provide so people can find the right fit. But remember, this is a paid job. You're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you for the mm-hmm. match. You have to feel comfortable with them. You have to feel like in the future, you'll be able to share certain things, right? You have to be a knowledgeable customer because you are disturbing. Well, Kay, um, look, I really appreciate you taking the time. Your journey has been amazing and you've, you've hit so many, like, I think important things and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to have you more and things. But, you know, one of the things I do like to ask, you know, everybody that comes in here um, is kind of, you know, I think reflecting back on everything you've done and going back. And if you were able to go back in time and talk to yourself again at a younger you and give yourself some advice, you know, what's something you'd tell yourself? Um, I think I would tell myself to not tell myself no, right? So this is something that I learned, like I said, from um, this great mentor, my second mother, Phyllis Aline. Um, She taught me not to say no to myself, right? So show up, send the application, show up to the event, apply for the school, apply for the position. Don't tell yourself no, just give your best effort and release it into the universe, right? So that was very, very helpful for me to learn around uh, when I was in my late 20s uh, because it changed the perspective of everything that I do. Um, I see see things more from the perspective of doing the best effort, showing up, taking the shot, and then I have become very able to release it 
So like, let's say one of the things that I want to do uh, in order to be able to share and, and to connect people with information and resources, I'm going to be pursuing um, events and media and I'm, I'm pitching for a TED talk that I've been like practicing and pitching uh, to different uh, organizations that do TED. And it's just like, I did my application, I sent it. And it's like, boom, next. So it's just showing up when we are looking at say to the schools for the children, like I was saying, independent schools, the schools are $70,000 a year, like for fourth grade, like not even like, you know, and then you see this price, you're like, oh my God, I, I could never, but you don't know how the way is going to remain. You just have to show up. You have to build yourself to a place where most likely thing is that you're going to win, you know, and I'm, and I'm very, um, audacious when it has to do with that. Like I'll be in my Instagram and be like, I'm going to get a TED talk. Mind you, I got no TED talk yet, but I've been saving, I've been saving uh, articles. I've gone to three, four TED talks. As a matter of fact, I'm going to one today uh, in the afternoon. I signed up for some Facebook group with a person that is like the TED talk whisperer. I already said it and I know it's going to happen, right? So I'm not telling myself, no, I am preparing myself. I'm positioning myself so that the things that I want will come to pass. So it's, not telling yourself now, but also preparing in advance before you need it. Even for my doctoral degree, I've been I've been thinking of a doctoral degree for seven years now. And finally I was able to enroll and I applied and I was accepted. And I, I went to open houses, I had my little folder, put in little things. I was on everybody's newsletter. But because of my life and my children were younger, I mean I had to advance more in my career so they would even consider me. But the year that it was like, boom, the kids are bigger, the two are graduating, the one is going to high school, I apply and I send that application and I released it. It's an R1 research institution, one of the strongest universities in the South, ridiculously wealthy, very, very competitive. And I was accepted. But if they would have not accepted me by the same token, the point is not telling myself no and continuing to prepare. And I think when you can put those two things together, it can allow you to get everything that you want and also everything that you need. Nice. Awesome. And uh, I think I love the whole concept. And I think it's something that this whole, the the whole thing of telling yourself you can do it, you know, believing in yourself and not telling yourself, no, it's true. I mean, there's so many opportunities I probably, you know, you're just applying for jobs. Oh, I don't have mm -hmm. the experience for that. And then you come to find out you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tom and Tucker, they're applying. Yeah. With no experience and yeah. no and no knowledge. They apply anyway. And I guarantee you I'll have a better interview. You know, it's just absolutely you know, and that's it's just believing in yourself sometimes in that confidence. Mm -hmm. Um and I think, you know, my last question for you is probably gonna be the most important question ever as a sneakerhead. What's your favorite sneaker style? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm partial to Jordans. So I love Jordans in in all colors, particularly red, beige. And also when it has to do with the sneakers, I want to let you know that I never had sneakers. So when I'm doing presentations, I tell people I was raised with shoes from La Sirena. And then eventually here, the stays from like Kmart, which most young people don't know what Kmart is, but it's the sad sister of Walmart. And I didn't get my first actual Nikes, like real Nikes until I was 40 years old. And it was a gift from my partner. And it was such a moment. And then after that, forget it. It was on like Donkey Kong. But it was such a challenge, challenging thing to do because it took 40 years. And then now I have like a sneaker collection that will make like grown men cry. But the most beautiful part of that is you can go from being the kid that has no Nike sneakers, no sneakers, definitely no Nike sneakers, to grow up to be the adult that not only has a Nike collection, but that Nike pays our money to see their employees. So that is that journey that while we're in it, we're in it to win it. And anything that you have, you cherish, but everything you didn't get, you can go back and get it. And that is the beauty of our journey, right? I never went to no study abroad. Listen, I was like, what? I'm 50. I'm going to go to study abroad. I started applying and figuring it out. I had never been in a dorm in a college because I was always a community student because, you know, money, obviously. And they had my residency, my doctoral degree. I was so excited for that little twin bed. It was like, oh, raggedy. I, I was like, I was throwing myself in the floor of excitement. I had my little dorm. I brought even decorations. I did too much. It was only for five days. But everything that you have, you cherish and everything you don't have, you can go back and get it, right? When, I, when we're in the spaces, for example, 
when they're independent schools, very wealthy families, and they always have a lot of like heirlooms, right? Oh, this watch was my grandma's, and this was this earrings for my great grandma. I, I don't got none of that. But you know what I got? What I got is I can go to eBay and I'm gonna buy everybody's grandma stuff. And I'm gonna be the grandma. I am the grandma. So I didn't have that. I don't have that for my children to be like, oh, that's from my great grandma. This is no, don't, don't you worry. I can create a task about that sorrow, about that hurt, about that lack. And I said, what can I do? And I was like, oh, look at eBay with all these vintage watches and rings and necklaces. So my children are getting that and my grandchildren will have it. Whatever you don't have, you can go get it. And while you're working and pursuing whatever that is, you can heal your inner child, right? The sneakers are not only sneakers for me. I mean, they're a fly. And they give me a lot of compliments for sneaker heads when I'm trying. But it's for me, for that little girl that didn't have it. Every time I go to my closet, I'm like, you know, and all of the things you can get, whatever it is that you're lacking, it's not permanent. It's not personal damage. Put it on a board, write it down, do the work, show up. And the universe is always going to deliver you. It has for me. Yeah, no, and it's it's funny because I, I grew up on Payless shoes. And I remember Ooh. the first time I got a pair of Reeboks. It was, it was, okay, it. but it was, it wasn't like the fanciest. It just happened to be like the, the, so we were going, we had to, a a brand. We were going to a wedding <laughs> and my Payless dress shoes did not fit me anymore. Uh -huh. So we had to go buy new shoes. But Payless was closed. There's only this one store in Pawtucket called Apex, which was kind of like a local version of like, kind of like a Sears. Kind of, you know, they sold mm -hmm. a little bit of everything. So they have the little sneaker section in the head. So my dad was going to go buy me shoes, but he's like, I'm not going to spend 30, 40 bucks on a pair of dress shoes that you're only going to wear now. And then you probably won't wear it for the rest of the time. So he's like, let me buy you some. Let me let's find a black pair of sneakers. And they were the black oh, pair of sneakers. Oh, that was a Reebok. Oh. And he <laughs> bought me a Reebok. And I was like, I was so excited. I was like, I got my, I got very, I wore the shit out of those shoes yeah, I can for imagine. the whole school you're in, year. You're in school they weren't the fancy. They it. weren't anything special, but they were, yeah. really, and I got, I have, oh, it's like, it's like one of my childhood stories. I'm like, oh my God. And then when I got older, I finally started working and I bought my first pair of Jordans because a buddy mm -hmm. of mine worked at the store and he was able to give me a hookup. So yes. we, I got, I paid him 60, $65 for a pair of Jordan ones the day before they released. Oh, I'm sorry. 85. Oh. And the next day I got to pick them up before people, before the store yeah. opened. So I went to school with the new Jordans that came out. Before oh, forget it. Even bought you, it. And I was you, like, you, you, you were that guy. That and so now, yeah, so now Jordan <laughs> 1s are like my favorite ones to, to keep right. buying. And, just... and, and when we think about things like that is also what I would tell myself is like, the world is bigger than what we think. Like I do this work now and because of the nature of the people that I work with, it's like, I learn all these things, right? That I didn't know myself even as a professional person like oh did you know that if you work for nike you get 40 percent off of all their products you know that if you work for peloton they give you a free bike to take home right that these people have all these bonuses and they have seniority bonuses and all these trips like we don't know anything about like your company paying for you to travel to conferences and then you get a per diem like for me also that's one of the things that i want to work on going forward is like so that I can give that information to the kids. The kids are going through it right now. They are eating, you know, those ramen noodles in the dorm and the floor that nobody can come and visit them on Parents Weekend. Like those kids that are like us, they need to know how life looks on the other side. And that's why I made time to speak with you. And, and I am so grateful that you're doing this work because the kids are in school now. They need to know that all this effort that they're doing, what's going to be the bounty when they get there. And they need to see people like us that are living a life that we dreamed and worked for and that still we have a runway of what comes next. Like I get giddy myself thinking about what comes next for me and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Like it is very exciting. You can build a life that you're excited about, that you are giving back, but that also people are pouring into you. So it feels very organic and, and just very joyful. Yeah, and it's definitely, like I said, when I did this podcast, it I've always kind of wanted to do something to give back and help people. And I'm like, you know, it's, we don't record enough of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have enough, we don't have a record of us and our stories and our journeys and what we did to get to where we are because it's, we feel like it's hidden and we're the only ones doing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago, you know, no internet, <laughs> like you said, there was no internet. Now yes, was let's present it. Let's show them what we're made yeah. of. So um, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it was great. 
talking to you today. But thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. And I definitely look forward to all of your episodes and I'll be listening. Thank you. And and I definitely want to have you back uh, in the future to discuss some more stuff as well. So keep me keep keep me on your LinkedIn and send me messages sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Thank uh, you. But to everyone else listening, thank you again so much for all your support. I appreciate you guys listening in. Um, and I hope you'll join me again next time as we continue to learn how to say success in Spanglish. <laughs>